Welcome everybody um, to, to our town hall. Um, I'm very happy to see um, familiar faces um, and we have an absolutely amazing um, um, lineup of speakers um, today and physically here with us and also online. So this is the town hall that is called Towards Ethical Principles for Responsible Technology and it is the first town hall at the Internet Governance Forum of Project Liberties Institute. My name is Paul Fellinger. I'm the Director of Policy, Governance, Innovation and Impact of this new organization. And um, before I tell you more about what we do, I would very much like to introduce um, our speakers today. And um, maybe each of you could just quickly mention your name and um, where you come from, with what organization you are. And I start here to my left, um, Elizabeth. Thank you, Paul. Uh, my name is Elizabeth Thomas Reno, and I'm with the OECD Global Forum on Technology. Hi, everyone. I'm Hiroki Habuka. I'm a research professor at Kyoto University Faculty of Law, and used to work for the government, a Japanese government, until last year. Thank you. I think it takes a second if you speak. Okay, here we go, sorry. I'm uh, Vivian Schiller. I am the executive director of Aspen Digital. Uh, we're a program of the Aspen Institute that focuses on media and technology and its impact on society. And I am based in Washington, DC. Very happy to be here. Wonderful, and I just got um, um, a message from our panelists that apparently the Zoom link that was on our event page um, led him to a different um, session. So. Maybe I can ask the technical team to, to somehow um, give me the right Zoom link so that I can share it with Paul Toomey, who's the co-director of the Global Initiative for Digital Empowerment, JIT, and um, the former CEO of ICANN, who's joining us remotely from Australia. And um, with me remotely today is also Sarah Nicole, who's our policy and research associate, who probably is in the same wrong session right now. So. Um, if um, somebody could send me by email the right Zoom link, um, that would be absolutely amazing. Um, uh, maybe somebody of the technological team could, could uh, take care of this. Um, we want to talk today about um, the future. We want to talk about what's next in the innovation pipeline and how we can foster responsible innovation. And we want to look at things like the data economy, artificial intelligence, web-free, quantum technology, the future of social networking, XR, computer brain interfaces, neurotechnology, and all of this. Basically, the underlying question today is, how do we create a fair, sustainable, and innovative digital future? So those are very big topics, and um, so is the mission of uh, Project Liberties Institute. Our mission is to advance responsible innovation and the ethical governance of new technologies for the common good. And we were founded last year by businessman Frank McCourt, and um, we at the Institute do basically three things. We catalyze solutions-oriented research um, on responsible innovation, on ethical governance, um, to foster evidence-based governance innovation. And we are very fortunate to have um, three founding academic partners already, which are Stanford University in Silicon Valley, Georgetown University in Washington, D.C., and Sciences Po in Paris and France. Our second mission pillar is that we bring together leaders um, spanning international organizations, governments, entrepreneurs, businesses, technologists, academia, investors, civil society, and others to advance responsible innovation. And we currently lead three initiatives, and one of them, which you will hear um, uh, of a bit more today, uh, on topics such as the good technical governance of web-free technical infrastructures, or how to create innovation frameworks for public and private decision makers for the mainstream adoption of digital ID systems, or on ethical principles for responsible technology, which is the topic of our session today. And this is something quite 
particular for an organization such as ours. We also steward an open source public infrastructure protocol, which is called DSMP, the Decentralized Social Networking Protocol, which allows to build social web applications that enable users to control the data they share in the digital economy, that enables the interoperability between digital services, and also gives the possibility in the infrastructure to economically participate in value creation with personal data. So, what's the intention um, um, for this session? We want to talk about ethical principles for responsible technology, and we want to look at the entire innovation cycle today. We want to look at how technology is designed, how we invest in new technologies, how we deploy commercially new technologies, and how we regulate new technologies. And we want to look at both the substantive side of ethical principles, but also we want to look a bit at processes um, for responsible innovation in the ecosystem. So with this, um, I would like to, to start with the first round of question, but before this, um, could I ask if somebody has the right Zoom link for online participants? You're amazing, thank you. So I hope that um, 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 Paul can join us soon as well. Um, thank you very much, Hiroki. <clears throat> so, if we think about ethical principles, I think the first thing a lot of you realize, and you're all experts, and I s see here in the panel, and I, I recognize some of you in the room, you all worked on, 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 on very important sets. Somebody from UNESCO told me the other day that when they did the recommendations on AI, they actually identified more than 630 different existing principles. So there's certainly no shortage on ethical principles for responsible technology. This is just for AI, but again, here we look at the broad picture. And there's this sort of tension that we have so many principles that actually nobody knows anymore what to do. And that's a big problem for where we are in, in our society that is heavily digitalized. And if you think about all the breakthrough technologies that hit market very soon from XR to computer brain interfaces, I would even argue that this is slightly worrisome um, um, for where we are in the ecosystem. So my first question to our amazing speakers is, what is the state of responsible innovation in your view? And also as a sort of sub-question, what do you think we could learn or should have learned or already learned from the past 10 or 20 years of technology development? Like where are we today? And um, uh, I would like you to, to sort of give you each the floor, and um, I would like to ask you to really give us first your ecosystem view, and um, I, you will have an opportunity to talk about the work you are leading a bit later, but I want to start by what's the state of responsible innovation today? Maybe, um, Elizabeth, if we can start with you. Thank you, Paul. Um, so I'll just start out with a few thoughts that I, I, I had before and, and might embellish those a little bit. I, I think the first thing is that there is quite a strong consensus around the need for significant and timely work on these questions. Um, we are seeing a lot of uh, different, we have seen and, and are seeing new initiatives um, that are cropping up. I think there are traditional approaches and also recent lessons that, policy, that, are, that give policymakers and stakeholders an impetus to say we need to start thinking collectively, a little further upstream, finding alignment on values and directing the development in line with respecting human rights, building in privacy, security, and accountability by design, not as sort of add-on features, trying to encase the technology after certain concerns are raised or issues develop. Uh, global cooperation has been cited in our early discussions um, as needing to be sort of an essential feature of, of the effort, be, just given the borderless nature of many of the technologies that we're talking about, and also the impact that they have on citizens from around the world. So they're not, that they really are citizens of the world that are affected by these technologies, and so um, the approaches need to be a little, a little broader than national or regional. Um, it's important that those efforts are directed um, at a sort of human-centric and values-based and rights-oriented development and use of the technology. And again, that, 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 that can't be done at the, at the end of the cycle. And it's, it's something that's sort of forcing us to say, 
are we getting this right? Are we, are we waiting too long? Do we need to think about this and align with each other um, sooner in the equation? And then um, we need to factor those technological implications, but also the societal um, considerations and, and, and offer implementable solutions um, that are both relevant and adapted to the people in the context of their culture and needs, and I'm not contradicting myself. We need borderless approach, uh, global approaches, but with the informed, sensitive considerations of that. And I, th I think there is a strong need for that. There are uh, instances where we've seen this um, working and in some of the dialogues that happen at the IGF on certain issues and then go into a technical community activity or a policymaking activity, um, and we can see that you get a better um, you get a better action and a more um, a, a, an initiative that can have traction in the community because of those thoughtful discussions that take place um, earlier. And then, of course, we also need to think about how to enable the e ecosystem innovation and the environment that will also reap the benefits of the technologies, not just mitigate um, some of the con concerns that we could have. And I think the last thing I'll just mention on this is that there are a lot of spaces, so it'd be really easy to say, um, and there are lots of actors contributing, and all of that's positive. It could be easy to say there are too many different things happening. I think what we really need to focus on is are we moving in the same direction? Are we reinforcing and complementing, uh, you know, being having complementarity in the efforts that we're making? Um, and 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 then are we sort of playing to our, our strengths and, and linking up those rather than trying to kind of create a, a one-stop shop for, for everything? Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, um, I just recognize that Paul joined us, so very happy that it works. Paul, do you quickly want to just introduce yourself and I will give you the floor after Hiroki. Uh, thank you, Paul, and well, greetings to everybody. I hope you can hear me okay. Perfect. Um, so I'm the, uh, I'm the co-chair of the Global Initiative for Digital Empowerment, which is a group of 70 or 80 sort of experts from about 29 countries, very concerned with the issues around uh, how do you have a human-centred approach to data governance and to internet rules and the sort of technology and innovation we're talking about now. Um, and I'm also a former sort of founding figure and CEO of ICANN, for those who've got a long memory. Wonderful. Thank you very much. Very happy to have you with us remotely. Um, so, Hiroki, you mentioned um, um, you're today you're an academic, but you used to be with the Japanese government, and um, uh, you were in a very interesting position because you led very important work on agile approaches to the governance of disruptive technologies, cyber physical systems, I think the name was Society 5.0, which is all of what we just said from XR to artificial intelligence to all of it together um, as a complex, how do you govern this? So you, you wrote um, a very important paper um, for, for the Japanese government, a strategy paper in that regard. So I think you're very well posted um, um, as well to, to answer the question like, where are we with the state of responsible innovation today when we look across the entire cycle? Are you confident? Um, how do you assess the status quo? Thank you very much for the extremely kind words. Um, yes, um, so le let me um, uh, talk about the history of AI governance, or AI regulation. Um, so as you mentioned, now we have like 630 principles, AI principles. So it started from late 2010s, so um, just after we started to implement the technologies. Um, and but according to my understanding, um, there are like 600 uh, principles, but the pillars are almost similar now. So like fairness, safety, security, or privacy, uh, or human centricity, or transparency, accountability, and you know, we have all things on the table. But how to implement it is a problem, question. And then after 2020s, we started to, I mean, some countries started to make a new regulation on AI. So uh, apparently the EU AI Act would be the one of the significant uh, new regulations on AI. And also Canada is now discussing AIDA, which is a new regulation on high impact AI. So um, there are a lot of uh, discussion going on. Now Japan uh, hasn't adopted the comprehensive approach. So we take more sector specific and more soft law based approach. 
But so let's see uh, how it, it goes. I mean, uh, so it should be always uh, risk-based. So. But anyways, whether you regulate it or not, uh, we already have, have some uh, very similar uh, risk management framework for AI, such as uh, United States NIST uh, AI risk management framework, or ISO IC42, where also Japan has some AI guidelines uh, for companies or you know the operators of the AI, and they look very similar. That says you know you should do uh, uh, impact assessment, uh, and then uh, treat the risks based on the multi-stakeholder communication and also uh, reviewed or monitored by uh, sometimes the third party. So this process looks very similar. Of course, the contents are a bit different each other, but um, so now we understand so what we, what we should do. And we should do the risk management processes in a uh, iterative manner or agile manner, I would say. So, but the real question is then, what is the impact? For example, what is a privacy uh, that should be protected under the AI or generative AI, or how to balance uh, some risks and benefits of AI. For example, uh, if you use the uh, AI uh, in the camera in the public space, it will inc dramatically increase the privacy risks, but also it will dramatically increase the efficiency of you know, uh, uh, safety of the uh, public society. So how to balance those uh, different values uh, which are in a trade-off situation would be the real question. So, uh, you know, uh, defining values or balancing values or how to solve it. I mean, uh, government doesn't have any idea about how to technically solve this question. So we always need to, you know, talk with a, a tech people as well. So, you know, those questions cannot be solved solely by the government. And that's why we need multi-stakeholder dialogue in an agile manner. Uh, and so Japan's agile governance concept is based on that. So we always have to uh, try to be a more um, multi-stakeholder and agile in governance. Governance doesn't only mean regulation, but also you know, more soft law uh, guidelines or democratic processes or, um, or corporate governance. So how to materialize rule of law in those different governance mechanisms in agile and multi-stakeholder manner is a real question. And I don't think um, any single person has the correct answer. So now all of us are struggling with that. Thank you so much. Um, that's that's very interesting um, because I think you highlight sort of um, the fact that this is a very thorny um, process and, and almost like a journey for all involved stakeholders to try to, to come to grasp with what to do. I want to give the, the floor to, to Paul who, who joined us remotely. Um, and, and Paul, you might not have heard the, the question um, um, before you joined, but we, w we want to understand in your view, Paul, what is the state of responsible innovation in general today, and what do you hope we have learned from the uh, um, first wave of technological innovation in the past um, one or two decades? Um, um, if we look back, what's your assessment of the status quo, Paul? Uh, thanks, Paul. Um, well, I'm, uh, I suppose I'm optimistic and pessimistic. So uh, uh, what we would say in Australia, two bob each way. Um, let me... Uh, say where I'm optimistic, where I think what we're seeing, uh, interestingly, and in, often in sort of larger or more established institutions, um, a real sense of trying to think about ethics as it applies to the development of technologies. Um, and I would point out to a couple of things, um, uh, you know, it, 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 it quite specific. I mean, I think we're seeing people who are producing ethical frameworks for business. I mean, I'm reminded of an initiative took place with a group of executives in the Silicon Valley, uh, people in Santa, uh, Santa Clara University and the Centre for Digital Culture in the Vatican, of all things, working together on a, um, a, a roadmap for ethical technology development, a practical roadmap. Um, so there's an example of people who are sort of working on how, you know, how do you, how do you put this into, your, into, into effect? Um, a lot of companies that I'm aware of have also taken one of the lessons from our community and said use multi-stakeholder processes to begin to identify issues early in the product development um, uh, stage so that they, they're they not caught, as you said before, with having developed something and having to fix the problems afterwards, but how do you actually run a series of processes with various stakeholders that help identify issues? 
Um, so I think that part's been interesting. And I think AI has been a good case study in some of this. Um, I would say that to give an example of potentially where the where I think get pessimistic or I think we've got a challenge is that it's one thing to say this for established institutions or established large corporates or corporates who've got a view about this. Um, it's another thing altogether for what happens in the sort of startup VC space. And so the classic one example at the moment, I think, is um, facial recognition, where we, you know, we've heard now through reporting that people like Google and others considered this and said, no, we should not do this. And then you get a startup like Clearview, mm. who turns around and sort of rampantly goes and <laughs> breaches everybody human rights and, you know, copyright and what have you, because it's a startup and it's funded by its VCs. Uh, and I think um, that dynamic is going to keep continuing. And while I'm a fan of the creative destructive aspects of destructive creative aspects of capitalism and innovation, you know, this is all good. There's a big difference, I think. I think there's a very big ethical difference between boards um, and investors and VCs saying, okay, we want, to, we want to upset an existing industry supply chain. We want to upset an industry structure. We want to find new ways of innovating. Let's take an example. Um, um, uh, you know, any, any of the car share writings companies, right, as an example. There's a big difference between that and we want to blatantly breach human rights for many people. And so I think one of the challenges we have to do, as I said to a friend of mine once at Harvard Business School, he said all these students wanted to sort of create these sort of businesses. I said, just tell them it's a sovereign risk. You're just buying vast amounts of sovereign risk. And the question is how long before that risk is going to hit you. And I think that is a role for the sovereigns is to send signals to the VCs, not just to the big corporates, but to the VCs saying, you know, be careful about the stuff you start throwing money at. Um, if it begins to breach human rights and other issues and other core ethical things, we will come down on you hard. And I don't know how we sort of do that when the European Parliament's begun to divide some of that, but I think that's an important issue. Thank you so much, Paul. This is um, um, an amazing framing we've gone from the international landscape um, um, to the view, especially of one specific um, government on, 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 on more agile um, processes. Um, Paul, thank you for mentioning the entire innovation cycle and the role of startups, the role of VCs, because those are questions we need to discuss. So I want to um, um, give the floor to Vivian, who has um, um, a very particular view because she has been a very accomplished journalist um, observing all those things from the outside. She has been inside the tech industry and um, she's now with Aspen Digital. So in your view, what's the state of responsive innovation? Where are we today? Thank, thanks, Paul. Um, uh, our, my co-panelists have said so many smart things that I'm, I'm, I'm busy crossing things off because I don't want to be too repetitive. But let me, like you said, I'm a, I'm a, a journalist and journalists were absor uh, uh, observers and reporters. So let me, let me just say a few uh, observations. Uh, we're too slow. We're too slow. Um, a lot of these processes understand the need to be inclusive. Of course they do. But the technology is moving so fast, and no matter how hard we try to future-proof um, what, what we're trying to govern, uh, we're still always going to be behind, and we need to think about that. Related to that, I don't think we always have the right people in the room for these conversations. There needs to be much more emphasis on technologists, um, in addition to all the other key stakeholders who are looking at issues like these civil society groups and government, et cetera. We need technologists. We also need big tech in the room. I've been, I cannot tell you how many times um, I've been in rooms with big tech not represented and when I ask, they go, well, they're the problem, so we don't want to let, you know, the fox in the hen house. It's like, yeah, but the fox, well, anyway, I'm not gonna, I'm gonna I, I don't know how to continue with that metaphor. Uh, first of all, they, they hold an incredible amount of power to actually make the change. They understand how a lot of the technology works better than anyone on the outside possibly could. They need to be in the room. That doesn't mean you necessarily have to, you know, have complete consensus with the room, including with big tech, about your decisions, but they need to be there. Um, sort of, and this, my next point is maybe going to sound a little bit like it's a, the opposite of what I just said, but we also have to remember that I've seen so much focus on, you know, in various contexts of sort of when we're talking about AI. Oh, well, we've, you know, we've, we've, we've got an agreement now with Google and OpenAI and Microsoft, so we're set. Not and yes, those are incredibly powerful players, 
and they need to be in the room, but there's an entire world of open source out there um, who are not represented, and that's just going to become more um, substantial. Um, just a couple of other uh, points. Uh, we are too quick to see regulation as the answer to everything. And um, Hiroki made, made this point. We need to think more broadly about governance. And then um, I will also repeat something because it's just worth repeating that Elizabeth said, um, which is we need to be thinking much more up, upstream in the process. Um, this whole idea of you know, safety and security or, or, or whatever it is that we're going after by design I think is critically important. So thank you. Thank you so much for this um, first framing round. And, and the reason why, uh, why, why, why you're sitting here on the panel is um, because you all lead very, very important um, um, initiatives um, in the ecosystem of responsible technology and the use of new technologies. And I would like to, to sort of um, um, give you the floor to explain a bit to, 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 to the people who follow us um, um, here in the room and, and, and also online on what exactly you do and how you fit into this ecosystem of how we design technology, how we invest in technology, how we build, um, um, uh, how we deploy technology and how we regulate technology. Where in the innovation ecosystem do you fit in with the, with, um, the, the, the kind of work that you're leading? And um, um, Elizabeth, you're the, um, leading the OECD Global Forum on Technology, which is a very interesting and new effort. Um, please tell us more. What's what's the vision and, and, and what's the role of this forum? Thank you very much, Paul. And, and Vivian, I feel like you just handed me the greatest ball to just hit, so I'm going to try and do it really well. <laughs> um, and But it's really gratifying to hear the, the points that you're making because it, it, it helps me. Um, feel encouraged by some of the approaches that are that we're hoping to pursue with the global um, for a global technology forum and what we like to call global forum on technology, which we like to call GF Tech. Um, so this is something. Those of you that know OECD may be familiar that it has policy committees that work on policy topics, sometimes they even agree on principles like the OECD AI principles. And these are tables of predominantly government delegates within the OECD membership. Um, and then they have stakeholder communities, particularly in the digital economy policy area. They have technical community, civil society, um, labor and trade, and they have um, the private sector. And so they work on the, this, these policy issues. The OECD Global Technology Forum is not about that. It is about opening up to a wider dialogue with non-OECD members included, with other stakeholders from other areas of expertise. And so this was something that was launched during the ministerial of the um, digital economy policy um, in, uh, the, in Spain, in the Canary Islands, in December 22, 2022. And we had our first inaugural event alongside the OECD ministerial event this June. Now, the forum is not just an annual event. It is a venue for regular, in-depth, strategic, and multi-stakeholder dialogue. So it has that wider community, industry, academia, civil society, and technical communities will be included in that. We're aiming to foresee and get ahead of those long-term opportunities and risks that could be presented by technology. And we intend to do that through two tracks. The first track is going to explain, explore technologies that are identified as ripe for immediate work. And so these technologies are going to be looked at through a lens of cross-cutting themes, sustainable development and resilient societies, responsible values-based and rights-oriented technology to achieve human-centric technological transformations, bridging digital and technology divides. And I'll maybe elaborate a little bit more on those a bit later. But the other track is horizon scanning. And this is where we're going to bring a broader community um, in, an, in an event or some activity like that in order to explore longer term opportunities and risks, figure out where those lights are happening on other technologies that may not be already um, uh, explored and discussed to help identify and analyze those t emerging technologies that may be of interest for work at a later stage. In those discussions, we'll probably also end up talking a bit about the convergence issues, because obviously, if you're going to talk about 
quantum. It's going to be hard to do so without AI. If you're going to talk about synthetic biology, it's going to be hard to do without some of the interplay in, in, in those technologies. Um, so I kind of gave it away. But the initial three um, technologies that we're going to focus on initially in the form are immersive technologies, synthetic biology, and quantum technologies. And so in order to go into those um, technology discussions, we're going to do what Vivian said we should do, which is we're going to bring the technologists into the room. We have the government delegates working in the policy committees. They're, they're going to help us identify some of their national experts, some of the experts in other areas, and we're also going to be building up a community of, of that broader um, scope. But we're, we, we're looking for real technologists, and we're also looking for experts in the ecosystem, understanding how the technology works in the ecosystem and what are the policy implications of that and technology implications of that. And so um, we're going to try and channel the insights of these experts that will orient and suggest pathways for policymakers to pursue. And again, to the point of going too slowly, this is also an opportunity for us to use focus groups as an accelerator, as a policy accelerator, to orient OECD and its partners towards the most relevant and needed policy work. So we take the priorities and we do them first. Um, and then the focus groups will also share amongst themselves those insights and perspectives. They'll hopefully increase collective understanding of the technologies as well as those ecosystems I keep mentioning. We're, we're, we're going to look to them to help identify gaps and bright spots, as well as to provide examples and data and help us do what OECD is really known for, which is building up that evidence base to help inform um, policymakers. So I will stop there. Thank you so much. This is um, such a bold vision, I think, and it's so necessary in the ecosystem um, to try to, to, to bring together the different threats and basically operate at, at this level. One thing that uh, actors often observe is that we're often surprised by new technology, and I think this forum is, a, is, a, is an important initiative to get on top of the innovation um, um, curve um, from, from your point of view. So, um, fascinating. Hiroki, you already mentioned um, um, that you worked before on agile governance. Um, before for Japan, now as an academic uh, and in the field of artificial intelligence, but many here in the room might not have heard about what Agile governance actually is. Could you explain this um, for at the level of, you know, as they always say, a ten-year-old? Um, <laughs> what is what is what does that mean for responsible innovation? Thank you. Um, the most simple meaning of agile governance is to make our governance system is more agile, multi-stakeholder, and distributed way. And the reason it's clear, uh, at least you know based on our discussion so far. Uh, so technology is just changing so fast. And in, in Japan, it takes at least two years to make a new regulation or even revise a re existing regulation. And it's just too long time considering the pace of the speed. So we need to change our approaches. Uh, and then what will be the alternative? Market, it doesn't necessarily work very well because of a lot of reasons, for example, in the huge uh, information gap between the government and the private sectors in a way that the government has now much less information uh, than the private sectors. Uh, or, you know, negotiation power. Uh, if you just want to use uh, the service provided by the big tech company, and if you don't have any other options, then you, you just, just click yes to your terms and conditions or privacy policies. So, you know, market is not always perfect. Then how about norms or, or ethics? Again, it's good, but it's not always so uh, you know uh, helpful. For example, uh, you know, so first of all, it's really hard to define your mean the, the meaning of ethical principles like privacy, or security, or safety, because AI is a system which moves just based on the. Uh, probability, so it doesn't give you a clear-cut answer. It always answers in a probati uh, probabilistic manner. Uh, uh, so, uh, so we need to find uh, define the values, but which is really difficult. And also, you know, we're not always correctly understanding what the risks are or what the technology is, and we are just easily get um, furious about 
easy to understand news about the problems caused by the a, a new technologies, but it's really difficult to also understand the benefits of the, uh, the, the new technologies. So uh, for those reasons, so all these different mechanisms will not work perfect manner, but we have to do something for the better future. So we always have to combine these different tools uh, so that we can uh, make our technology more trustworthy. And the only solution or only direction we can go is just try different approaches and see if it works or not. And if it doesn't work very well, we should quickly update it. For example, when we talk about regulation, for the first question we should ask is, is this activity already regulated or not? And if yes, maybe uh, if it is already regulated, for example, you know, car driving or you know, giving legal advice or medical advice, then if you try to uh, make AI do the same work, for sure we need uh, alternative regulation for AI. But how to make it is a different question. But anyways, it's, uh, maybe it's better to uh, have another regulation for AI. But if the activity is not regulated for the human beings, then we really have to ask why we need a new regulation because of the reason that this is done by AI. Because uh, what the AI does is just statistically analyze the past data and, uh, to, and give you the, the mm -hmm. most probable answer which has been done by human beings for long years. So, um, and AI can do the work more efficiently and precisely. So why would we have to uh, regulate it? So there might be a lot of reasons. For example, it will dramatically increase the privacy risks or safety risks, et cetera. But anyway, so we always have to consider those questions and there will be no answer before you, you try. So you only understand the risks after you try it. So that's why we really need iterative approaches. And in Japan, traditionally, we believe that uh, the government shouldn't make mistakes. So there shouldn't be no uh, mistakes by the government. But we just have to, uh, to, to change our mindset. We have to admit that a government can make mistakes, uh, so as private sectors, uh, so as citizens. So, and we should understand what we can learn from those failures. And, and this is exactly the same attitude which is necessary for software development. It sounds like, uh, uh, it makes me sort of think, I, you used yourself the, the term mindset shift, yeah. uh, mind, mindset shift, because it's almost counterintuitive, um, especially from a public sector point of view, um, um, to experiment and to potentially expose or accept a certain amount of risk or uncertainty but what I find very interesting in this approach is that by actually spelling it out and just saying, well, there is always uh, uncertainty and risk, you, you don't really know. Um, and, and if you don't know, you call it uncertainty. If you know what could wrong but don't know to what extent, you call it risk, okay? But w it's, it's an interesting sort of mindset shift to, to, to say, like, okay, well, if this is how we, the reality <laughs> looks like, then what do we do? Um, I want to give the floor to to uh, to, to to Paul um, because he leads um, a very interesting initiative that he already mentioned um, himself, which is called JITE, which is yet a different puzzle piece um, um, in the in the international landscape or the ecosystem. Um, an example of an initiative um, in the public interest to work more on the infrastructure level. So, Paul, can you can you explain a bit more what what do you want to achieve and how and how how does it enhance responsible users of technology and responsible innovation. If you are still but I was with unmuted, us. But I was muted, so I'll try that again. Thank you. Um, the um, guide is, a, is a, an international initiative by accident. Um, and that accident was a conversation that I had with a uh, then head of the Keele Institute for International Economics at a Saudi Arabian G20 meeting, where uh, I think the buses were late or something, and we ended up having a long conversation about surveillance capitalism. Um, and we decided, was you know, we, people should really think about this and what, what's the implications. And it's been a fascinating uh, product of thinking through what is this, what are the implications of that model we've got in the digital economy. Um, uh, from an economist's perspective, and he's a very senior international economist, um, and then somebody more from the communications and um, uh, internet and what have you policy uh, process. Um, and we've ended up being joined by 70 or 80 of our closest friends, if you like, 
uh, I said that jokingly, people who are experts in various areas around the topics would come up. And, and what what has been the, the consequence of this of, of this analysis? One is um, we've actually thought through the whole market structure for the international digital economy, and to some degree, if you think about it in simple terms, we have consumer, we have users, consumers. Let's call them consumers. Um, you've got uh, digital service providers over here, um, and that's still pretty basic. You know, I said you something, you buy something, sort of model, Adam Smith. Um, and for e-commerce, these digital service providers, they interact with other producers, manufacturers. Now, if that was just the digital economy, it'd all be fine. And it works, that works as a market in the sense that the individuals who are involved actually uh, do have power, uh, partly because they've got legislative power under things like Sales and Goods Act, et cetera, but often because they've got good knowledge and understanding of what's going on. And one of the best indications that this works as a market is that the margins are relatively thin and the consumer is king. Um, it's about $5 trillion um, size uh, market at the moment per annum, uh, and that's fine. And if that was it, we wouldn't be here. But the, of course, we all know there's the dirty underground activity, which is the service provider saying, in return for my letting you participate in the international digital economy, uh, you can get my app, my connection, my whatever, in return for which I'm going to harvest unbelievable amounts of information about you that you've got no idea about how much. And I would argue there's not a single person on the planet who's got any idea exactly how much data gets 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 um, rewarded. Now, in then thinking through that, we've we've looked at it and said, well, that, that data gets 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 reviewed, but the data is done in such a way that it is the market was all driven by advertisers and others, and the skills all sit in that market. But the but the cons the, the the people who should be the consumers are not consumers; they're the product. And so we focused a lot about what would be the implications if you were to change that such that the consumers were actually, that the users were actually the consumers and they could play a role in the market for personal data in particular. And we're not necessarily talking about you know, making data privacy rights, but we're saying essentially if people have the right to decide who has access to key parts of their personal data and under what terms and had the right of association and representation such that the skills that are sitting in one part of the market already could come and actually work for consumers we would end up with the sort of liberalization and innovation that we saw in financial services over a long period of time as as as, as dennis would say you know you're basically taking what took place between 1820 and 1860 or 1870 in, in the industrial revolution that whole process that was both bringing people together and empowering them, which which ended up with the middle class. So we think that the, we've got several propositions we've been in discussion with a number of governments and entities about where that just making that, that shift and that policy, and there's a lot more detail behind that, could end up with addressing many of the things that have been misalignments in the digital economy, because at the moment it's driven by only one incentive system, which is advertising, and that advertising serves only one part of what is an ecosystem. Thank you. Thank you very much, Paul. Um, this is a very interesting um, uh, initiative and a very important one and um, in many ways follows a similar philosophy that also led to the development of the decentralized social networking protocol that we at uh, Project Liberties Institute are stewarding the governance of. Um, I want to, 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 to uh, give the floor to Vivian, um, and you sort of have two hats on here on the, on the panel. You're with Aspen Digital, and Aspen Digital does a lot of amazing things, but we're also jointly leading um, the global multi-stakeholder initiative on ethical principles for responsible technology. But before we come to this, I just want to, to also give you the opportunity to tell us a bit more, Aspen Digital, well, what are you doing at Aspen Digital, and how does it foster responsible yeah. innovation? Great. Thank you. Yes, I will. I will not talk about our project together. We will save that for a couple of minutes, and I'll just talk more broadly about Aspen Digital. So our 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 favorite topics are ones that are incredibly complicated and tangled and thorny and fast moving, and where there's a lot of chaos and a lot of misunderstanding. We love those. The good news is there's a lot of uh, issues like that out there, and um, so we have plenty of work to do. Uh, what we do best, we're not researchers, but we bring groups together across sectors for information sharing and really for sense making. And I know this sounds very simple, but it, 
in, in many ways it is what we have discovered, it's really a, an incredible gap uh, because groups, it, it is, oh, it never ceases to be shocking to me that groups are not talking to each other when it comes to, to, to complicated issues. Yep. People in government, first of all, people in, just the U.S. government, people in the U.S. government, different parts of the U.S. government are not talking to each other. I cannot tell you how many meetings I've had with various representatives from different parts of the United States government. They're meeting each other for their first time and going, oh, you're doing that? They so are we. business cards, yeah. Yes, I exactly. So we bring we those together. So, about. you know, if we did nothing else, I think that would be <laughs> worth it. But, you know, groups from government, groups from the private sector, tech, private sector tech, but also the rest of the private sector who are not tech companies, who often get left out of the um, conversation. Of course, academics and researchers, civil society groups, um, and we try to bring not the public in, but at least representatives um, of the public. Um, so what's a, a and, and, and we do not drive the action, but we ignite their ability to drive action. So just a couple of quick examples. Um, we have a lot of focus on um, information integrity. Um, and so we had something um, called the um, Aspen Commission on Information Disorder, uh, which, was a, which was sort of a panel of people from across sectors where we really identified, again, complicated issue, lots and lots and lots of people working on it, but just like what we're talking about here, not a lot of action happening. So what we did there, and which is our model for everything we do, is to look at all of the great people who are already doing that work. We're not there to reinvent the wheel. We're not trying to pretend that we're the first in the space. But what we do is we elevate those best ideas. And then we sort of distill them with these group of experts. And we, and we drive action, which actually we did when it came to the recommendations from, um, from this commission. Cybersecurity is a big area of focus for us, both US domestically and, and globally. We bring groups together to, uh, again, share critical information and then drive action, uh, countless examples um, there. We have something, another example, we have something called the Tech Accountability Coalition, which is for tech companies in terms of trying to hold them responsible for their commitments that they have made but don't necessarily uh, follow through on when it comes to diversity, equity, and inclusion, both in the way that they recruit and hire, the way that they upskill, but also the way that they approach uh, the development and release of products and, how's those in, and how those in, impact um, uh, underrepresented uh, or vulnerable communities. And of course, lately, everything is about AI. So we've been on a round of um, work where we have been asked to come in and sort of help different groups figure out what's going on. Literally, we convene members of Congress at their request to help educate them on, you know, take sort of like, you know, so many people are in the weeds. There's so many groups that have specific interest. So our, we don't have a particular interest in any, you know, we're unaffiliated. So we are able to bring in experts and help bring sense making to them. We've done the same thing and we are continue to do the same thing for journalists and the news media. We have convened all around AI. We have convened the heads of philanthropic and foundations to help them understand what's happening with AI and how that can impact their philanthropic giving. We're doing the same thing with uh, private sector companies around how they think about the impact of AI on labor markets. And, and we're now setting off on very, very substantial work around the intersection of AI, elections, and trust. I think I, most people in the room know that 2024 is going to be a gigantic year for elections, an unprecedented number of uh, very consequential national election. So that's a little bit what we do without mentioning our project together. <laughs> Wonderful. And, we, and what are you giggling about, Paul? Well, I'm just giggling that um, 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 Elizabeth has a collector's item, which um, um, the previous organization, which I, which I co-founded, um, uh, which is called the Internet Jurisdiction Policy Network, she has a collector's notepad from the second global conference we did, um, um, hosted by the governance of Ottawa in 2018, and I was very surprised to see this five years later here this in This is Kyoto. the power of swag, by the this way. Is swag the is very important. This, this swag has a lot of carbon footprint as well. It, it won't. <laughs> um, 
I would. I, I think um, um, as a segue to tell you a bit more about um, the um, global multi-stakeholder initiative um, 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 that we're leading on ethical principles for responsible technology. Um, Mark, um, if I can put you on the spot, you ask a perfect question in the chat that is the perfect segue to the next uh, part of our discussion. I think this microphone is NetMundial style where you should go to, to ask uh, uh, a question. If you can just ask your, your amazing question, which is uh, exactly the provocation we need. Well, thank, thank you, Paul. And please Mark. introduce yourself. Yeah, sure. Uh, thank you, Paul. Yeah, Mark Havel, I'm an uh, internet governance uh, consultant. Dynamic coalition here at the IGF on uh, cybersecurity uh, standards uh, deployment called ISDC. And our coordinator is here at the back, Valter Natras. And um, but my my question was really about you know going right back to the beginning actually when you started to talk about um, ethical innovation. Um, I mean that sounds like a wonderful ambition and a starting point to address um, risks associated with, with emerging technologies. But of course, innovation is inherently groundbreaking. It's, it's getting into, it's, it's, it's from the Latin, nova, new. Yeah, everything's new. And uh, the designer of the, of the product or service is focused on what that's gonna do in a particular way that's going to create a new market opportunity, whatever. But of course, history shows that innovation can actually lead to unintended consequences and impacts. And um, even you know, in, inadvertently, things that were not anticipated. Um, and sometimes maybe when a product or service is, is maturing through development phase, some of those things might become apparent, but they tend to, you know, the, 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 the commercial instinct is to try and sort of oh, skirt around that and keep going. Um, so that raises the question in my mind as to how, how you can be certain in pursuing ethical innovation when you know there are those uh, risks of, of of consequences that would derail such an ambition, but which may be unstoppable. So that that was my question that I uh, this uh, put is in the chat. This is thank you. I could not have invented a better segue. This is this is exactly. There's a name for this, by the way. Um, uh, 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 this is called the Colin Rich dilemma. You you cannot regulate something, address something. Um, you know, technology has a life cycle. Before it's not mainstream adopted, you don't know what happens with a technology, what it does itself or what people might or might not do with it. So how can you regulate it um, before it's mainstream adopted? So this is a conundrum which almost sounds impossible, but yet again, this is exactly the world we live in and with all those massive breakthrough technologies coming in the next two decades that we already know of today from computer brain interfaces, quantum AI uh, and XR, which will transform our entire economies and social fabric. Um, this is a question we nevertheless have to ask ourselves, even if it's an uh, in incredibly wicked problem as, uh, uh, or non-trivial question, as, as engineers like to call it. And this is why we created this um, initiative. It is incredibly bold, but yet I hope um, we approach this with the necessary level of humility because this is very, very difficult. And this is why we decided to consult the smartest people we can find um, um, on those questions. And this global initiative that we launched um, um, a couple of months ago, um, I think has five criteria um, or, or five elements that make it special or particular. Um, the first element is we want to look at new technology at large, not just one vertical bucket like AI or XR. We want to look at exactly what, Mark, you just described. Um, new technology over and over again, it's the same mechanics of very disruptive things arriving and us not knowing what to do with it, um, with all the different economic and social factors involved. And we want to take a 360 degree view in this work throughout the entire innovation cycle because a lot of efforts historically have focused just on regulation at the very end. We want to look from the onset how is technology designed and developed, how is capital allocated through venture capital and other modes of, of capital. 
how are things commercially deployed and, and, and ultimately, yes, how are things are regulated, of course. And I think an, a third element is we don't only want to look at principles um, and have yet the 631st uh, set of, of principles, but we want to look at what, what I think especially Hiroki um, highlighted very strongly, at the processes and, and managing uncertainty, managing risk. This is a complex dynamic equilibrium and um, I think this is a mindset shift that, that we hear from, from, from everybody we, we talk to. And our ambition is that what comes out of this proce process is operational. We, we don't need a 631st set of principles. There are extremely good sets of principles already out there. But the question that everybody, no matter what stakeholder group you're in in the ecosystem is wondering is like, so what? How does this work in practice? How does this apply to my work? And yes, it's difficult, but we need to figure this out. And this is part of talking about ethical principles. And last but not least, and this goes to what Paul um, 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 highlighted with his initiative, we also want to look at enabling infrastructures of the entire ecosystem, the technological design of, of new technologies, and how this interplays with ethics um, by embedding them or enhancing them. So with this, um, Vivian, I would like to, 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 to kick the ball back. Can you tell us a bit more about what we actually do, how yeah. we do it, yep. what we've already done, and what are the next steps? Yeah, thanks, Paul, and thanks for laying out the core principles that, that guide this work. It's very important, and it's been a wonderful project, and it's been really great to um, collaborate uh, with Paul and his colleagues and the, on the Project Liberties Institute on this. So we've been doing a series of consultations um, because we want to uh, make sure that we are building upon a foundation of all of the good work that has come before us on this and that is continuing to work. You know, as Paul said, we're not trying to build the 631st, we're trying to build upon all of that. So we've been doing a series of consultations around the world. We're bringing together leaders and advocates and builders and funders from various sectors. We've had 10 different meetings uh, uh, so far uh, across, uh, well, after in a couple of weeks, it will be five continents. Uh, we have included uh, to date 200 people across those consultations. We started at RightsCon in Costa Rica. We were then in Kenya, uh, then in, uh, at Sciences Po in, in Paris uh, for a European consultation. We're here now. And then um, the final um, set of consultations will be at Stanford uh, in the US in a couple of weeks. And everything that we've heard and that we've learned through these consultations will influence and, and, and really guide a draft a document that we will be sharing for feedback um, in mid-December, um, then with a final document that we will hope to be uh, finished in February of next year. So we're on a very fast timeline. It will have very specific proposed actions. As, as Paul mentioned, it will not just be a set of principles, it will be a set of processes and the so, and the so what and, and, the, and so who as well. So, uh, you know, we've learned, it's, I, I don't want to preempt, we're still synthesizing everything. We've learned a lot, but just a couple of insights which actually have come up on this call today, I mean on this uh, panel today so far. So, um, we, there are, all those 630 uh, sets of principles are, are out there, but guess what? The problems are still with us. So um, <laughs> we, yeah, so our work is not done. That's one thing that is, that is very clear. Um, another insight, regulation um, is a very powerful tool, but it is not the only tool. And often what we fail to take into consideration, and, um, and Hiroki, you, you, you mentioned, you alluded to this before, is that there are existing laws that are already in place that can be applied to new technology. We don't have to create a new technology, I mean a new set of laws or regulation for every new technology comes along. Often it is uh, existing technologies that already exist, I'm ah, sorry, I'm mixing up my words. Lost. Exi existing regulations or laws that already exist can be applied, it could be human right, around human rights law, or copyright, or consumer protection safety standards. Um, those are in place, and they are time-tested, 
And you know, it's maybe not always obvious how they apply to new technologies, but we should start there. Uh, the third is that there are, uh, we must, and um, uh, Elizabeth, you alluded to this earlier, these ideas cannot just be coming from you know, the, the, the US and the EU, uh, but from all over the world. You know, we are, uh, you know, the kinds of ideas and the amazing work and um, uh, case studies that we heard in our Kenyan consultation from across Africa were really enlightening um, and stunning, for example. And, and then just lastly, we need, and again, we've talked about this uh, earlier on the panel, we need to find ways to influence what is built before it enters the market. To do that, we need more than regulatory approaches. Um, we we'll need to have sort of open development process that balances speed and innovation because those are important. We cannot ignore those with public interest. So that's where we are, but much, much more to come. Yeah, and this is why I would like to, to, to ask the question to, to everybody who's following us remotely and who's here in the room and, and of course, to, to our amazing speakers. Um, um, so how should we develop, invest, deploy, and regulate new technologies? Um, in, an, in a nutshell, what do you think is sort of the important crux in the ecosystem that is not yet working as it should work um, um, from po your point of view? Are there some remarks? Um, yeah, please take the, take the floor and please introduce yourself. Yes, hello, thank you, Paul. Walter Nazris, coordinator of the DC IS3C, Internet Standard Security and Safety. I think we are about 50% of our members here present. At least, I mean, 50% here in the room. Um, what I miss in this discussion is the following. We have now several research reports out and they all point to the same thing. Governments discuss cybersecurity and they don't procure secure by design. All the research that we've done show that there's hardly any government in the world who has in their procurement documents something about cybersecurity, let alone the internet standards that run the internet. They don't recognize them in their legislation. So when we talk about the public core of the internet and the protecting of the public core, they don't even recognize what the public core is. So what my question would be is should, when we talk about new developments in ICT in whatever form, should there be a component where governments take a lead when they buy it? Because that would be a major driver for industry and create a level, play, level playing field. Because everybody not delivering would not be selected. So would that be an option? I think this is a very interesting remark. And, and I think it's yet another remark that highlights the connection between capital, investment, procurement, and ethics uh, when it comes to new technology and how you implement standards or roll out standards across an ecosystem. Thank you. Thank you for this question. Let's collect a few more. Um, if, if, if somebody else would like to take the floor from, from, from the audience or online. Otherwise, I, I, I maybe kick it back to, to, to Paul, um, um, who's following us from Australia. Well, I wonder, just picking up on the cybersecurity one, I, I wonder if, um, you know, one practical thing we can do, and I'm sorry if I'm going to target somebody from, you know, if there's somebody in the room who's from the OECD, then I just have to target them. That's how it works, really. Um, so here's the challenge I put this to, perhaps to an OECD audience. Um, we presently, in, in, in most parts of the world, have a governance system for private sector companies which relies on the concept of a board and a board having some form of accountability for how it works. And yet what we have increasingly in the cybersecurity example is, is, is a core celebra. What we have is boards who are made up of lawyers and accountants and overwhelmingly lawyers and accountants um, because they were the risk issues for the last 150 or 200 years in, in, in companies. But nearly every company now is a digital company. Nearly every company has increasingly become a data company. We talk about digitization. And yet we don't have sitting as a core part of the curriculum or the or the general multilateral governance models around corporate governance and any signaling which says board should actually know something about technologies. Board should actually know something around data. Um, there's a clear issue there around cybersecurity, but the other part of it is 
is around also around the ethics of technology. Um, the lawyers and accountants are there often because you know they are especially trained in their backgrounds around not only accuracy but also ethics <laughs> and what is the right thing to do. Um, we should be doing the same thing, I think, in trying to put a challenge to the corporate governance models where we have much more building in of um, accountability both for the ethics and the operations of data and technologies inside companies. So I, I put that to you as one of the things that could be a, a, a real forcing mechanism because when the companies themselves have board members who worry about these things, the vendors will change behavior. Thank you, Paul. I think that's a very important point you raise on, on, on the bucket of deploying new technologies. Um, and I think we can even look at other sectors. Um, if we talk about sustainability and climate, especially on board governance level, it's not perfect, but at least we're, I don't know if we're 10 years ahead or more, but uh, if we compare it to the technology sector, um, it's much more developed uh, in terms of consciousness that there's a need to act and, and um, we s just start now thanks to artificial intelligence and it's sort of being a global cross-cutting massive issue. Those discussions I think start but we're at a very, very early stage. So th I think this is a very important point. Uh, I see Hiroki uh, nodding uh, a lot. What, how, what, do you, what do you think, um, 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 if you think across the innovation cycle, sort of, what's, what's your recommendation? Um, what, is, what is missing? Um, the first of all, what I believe missing is that the mindset of each uh, stakeholder. Uh, for example, uh, the government should change their mindset in a way that they cannot control everything, they cannot rule everything, they cannot expect, expect everything. So, uh, so government should be uh, more, you know, uh, be more like facilitator role or maybe incentive uh, provider role rather than controlling roles. So that is a uh, part of the government. Can and I just interject? Um, does this mean anything goes? Sorry? Does this mean anything goes? Does uh, no, this no, mean no, is no, this no, an yeah, ultra-liberal yeah, yeah, yeah. approach to yeah, technology yeah. regulation? Great, great question. So, um, so when I said incentive provider, uh, I mean the designing the regulation or liability sanction mechanisms in a way that promotes more um, ethical behavior or uh, sharing information about uh, the accidents or, you know, the or private parties' uh, initiative on setting their own uh, ethics and implementing it. For example, if, as, as it is now, if we make the regulation in a very specific uh, prescript, uh, prescriptive manner, then uh, it will, uh, on one hand, harm innovation, and on the other hand, cannot prevent new risks which will be uh, uh, derived from new technologies. So instead of that, Regulation should be more principle-based or process-based rather than the specific, you know, uh, 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 prescriptive uh, rule-based ones. And, but still there will be a gap between what the regulation said and actual operations. So we need some uh, intermediate uh, rules, which might be like standards or soft laws developed by multi-stakeholders. So considering the big tech's perspective or civil society's perspective, uh, and that could be updated more agile manner. And also it's just a soft law, so you can uh, even uh, uh, can, can, can achieve the better goals in a different way. So this is uh, a, a a kind of the, a type of regulation which we could consider. And also, if we consider the liability systems, at least in Japan now, if you disclose the bad information earlier, then you will be criticized more because it has more news value. And also the regulators just come into it and, uh, and, and try to trigger the, the sanctions. But uh, maybe we could make new incentive mechanisms that will give uh, award for companies that uh, detected the problems and reported it and cooperated with the investigation, uh, or maybe um, uh, 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 suggest new improvement measures. So uh, we could give award for those companies even after the accident to incentivize the companies to be more ethical after the uh, after something bad happens. So you know, this kind of the design of regulation or, or, or liability systems 
uh, are something we have to consider instead of you know trying to understand everything and consider uh, uh, trying to control everything. So th that is a um, uh, the government part, and of course the citizens also have to understand that there is no perfection in regulation or you know the the new technologies. Uh, so we have to always consider that there is always tra trade-offs, and we should focus not only on the risks to status quo, but also to the uh, opportunity risks, which will be actually a lot if you w if we, we just miss the opportunity to, to, to use new, te new technologies. Maybe a lot of a, uh, 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 public services will not be delivered, or a lot of a, uh, um, innovation couldn't happen because of that. So yeah, we, we, we always have to consider the trade-off. Thank you, thank you so much. I think you started with this um, um, mindset shift um, um, and you actually finished with talking about almost the culture of innovation and regulation at large because how we react to mistakes, um, this, is, this is more than just a mindset shift. This is a fundamental cultural shift in our risk-averse cultures where everything is focused on safety and should be focused on safety. Uh, this is, again, counterintuitive to the mainstream way we approach um, 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 regulation. So thanks for, for sharing those important yet provocative sort of um, um, thoughts. That's, that's the kind of topics we need to discuss. Martin, um, if you could introduce yourself and, and, and please uh, give us your sort of uh, hope and view. Thanks, Paul. I'm Martin. <laughs> Martin Bottemann, and a uh, pleasure to be here. And thanks for that. And basically, the, the, the set where you just gave is from responsible disclosures to responsible technologies, right? Because I think the principle for uh, responsible disclosures is, is, is very uh, much that you avoid more problems by being transparent, by being uh, active, and, 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 and reduce the risk. Uh, and the good news about responsible disclosures is you're not the only country uh, trying to find its way in it. There's many countries. And I think we can learn a lot from what's happening around the world. And I think uh, making responsible disclosures ethical around the world would be a thing that would favor that. And we have seen some examples where responsible disclosures have led to better uh, uh, acceptance of that company. So, so it's not hopeless. Uh, and I think it's the only way. Same for responsible technologies. Uh, Paul, I appreciated what you said about, uh, well, boards are responsible, they have a responsibility. Uh, and some of that may be ethical. The problem with ethical responsibility is that it's also different, like law per jurisdiction. Ethics is not the same around the world. So how, do we can, how can we come to some global understanding? Because we talk about global technologies that may be deployed in one country and may be used in 70 other countries, even if the service is originating from a third country or that same country. So that's why I think some kind of uh, global guidance is important and principles is a first step to it. Because if at least from with your projects you can generate some global good practice, that sets a standard that uh, around the world uh, companies and maybe also governments will take into account when they're thinking of how to implement it. The big advantage of that is also that governments don't only first dive into their own jurisdiction because there's law everywhere. We don't do this in isolation. But if they dive in in their own jurisdiction first, you may end up with all kinds of arrangements that are impossible to respond to for those global companies who deliver the services and, and, and things. So uh, the earlier we have some global understanding about good practice and the project may well contribute to that, the better. So I urge you to continue. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, thank you so much, Martin. And um, I want to, 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 to give the floor to, to Elizabeth to, to, um, to also tell us, given also the amazing opportunity with this ambitious mandate that uh, the, the um, GF Tech, uh, as, as is the acronym I just learned, um, uh, has. What's your hope towards um, the future of responsible innovation, how we deal with 
those cutting edge breakthrough technologies and public interest developments of them. So that's very ambitious. <laughs> I'm going to be a little bit more um, uh, low scale, I think, um, or or sort of a little bit more um, what are the practical elements that we can offer to the equation because I think like Vivian one thing that really strikes me as we start to look at some of the technologies perhaps not every single one of them is that we have a lot of policy work there and if you take the immersive technologies and when people talk about the metaverse we don't need to reinvent the majority of things there are a lot of things already there there are some questions like all the biometric data that's going to be collected and the speed and the intensity and the density of all of that and what are the implications of that. And that's going to then go into the discussions of the uh, privacy um, commissioners and others who, who look at those issues and try to figure out what, what elements need to be tweaked or what frameworks or, or, or um, even you know with the OECD privacy framework, it, it will apply, but what, what are the nuances, what are the details? But, other than that, there's those component parts that already exist. And so one of the things um, when we think about uh, how, how we can help and support that exercise in the OECD context is um, both piping into the discussions in the Global Forum, for example, what, what already exists in those policy areas, security, connectivity, um, privacy, but also things like competition and IP rights and trade and, and, and all of the issues that have the lever components. And I, and I liked, Paul, good for you for being provocative, because I also think the private sector piece and understanding what the levers are um, there and the, and the procurement idea, I'm very much hoping this is exactly what we're going to hear inside those focus groups are all the different ideas. And then some of the things that we can do is go away and, and understand the measurement side of that. So what happens when people are using that example in this sector, how does that, how can, what can we understand from that and perhaps offer as a proposal? What are those in, unintended consequences of such ideas? And where are the opportunities that exist that we haven't tapped to? Um, you know, to, to, to tweak the, the policy. And the last thing I'll say about that is that I think we're not looking for, um, the, the principles get you started and they orient, it helps everyone understand where north is. But once you have north, you have to figure out how do you actually, you know, what are the different roads that you're gonna take <laughs> in, 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 in getting there and how do you, you know, um, get around the roundabouts and other issues to take that analogy a bit further. Um, and, and to do that, I think um, I was going to use the term toolkit, but since I'm on this little journey on my road, I'm going to use a backpack. And so what are the things that you need in there? And, and um, you know, you need your compass, you need your granola, and you, whatever. So you pull in your policies um, or uh, so you develop the kind of um, guidance and understanding. Uh, and it can be... Um, you know, I think of the AI um, example inside the OECD right now. There were the principles done, but there were this, there's this experts group, and they're working constantly to help um, understand things like um, compute and the, the demand for compute and what's happening because of the certain policies that are in place for certain markets and, and what are the implications of that on the way the technology is developing and also divides and other things. So. All of those um, questions and pursuits, I think, come together. So, so just finally, it's more, I think, a composite of things that get brought together um, to uh, to help the understanding, rather than anything um, sort of very visionary and overarching. If I may. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, Last but not least, um, um, and you might be slightly biased in, 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 in this, um, Vivian, what is, what is your hope with regards to, to how we um, uh, address uh, responsible innovation and basically what we can achieve with this global consultative process and all the wisdom that, that, that people share um, 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 with us? Well, I, think it, I think it's everything we've been talking about, which is ma marrying uh, the principles and a practical way to see those principles turn into action. So the processes, like uh, Hiroki was talking about, 
or the and and the and the global multi-stakeholder nature of it, as the other panelists have been talking about, and making sure that there, we, that, you know, the dream is that we can actually see some of this, every all of the smart people that we've been talking to throughout all these consultations, to see their incredible ideas actually come to pass and influence and take us on a better journey. So even though we will know, I, I will pick up your metaphor, Elizabeth. We know that we're we know that we're heading south, but we have a more detailed roadmap uh, to get there. So we know which way we know we need to make a right turn here and a left turn there, and who we're what passengers we're going to pick up along the way. Thank you, um, uh, thank you for for sharing this. If if I sort of ask this question myself uh, <laughs> as a as a, as a sort of um, final final afterthought uh, on on this, I I hope that um, this global consultative process can also help um, um, to, to shed light on the known unknowns, um, as, as, as they call it in, in, in risk management. Um, we cannot address what we don't know, and, and, and right now the ecosystem with all the hype on AI, tomorrow's hype on quantum, and um, who's actually talking, we're not talking enough about computer brain interfaces, which will be a, again a complete game changer on, on how we interact, interact with technologies. And, and often more is different um, and changes things dramatically. Um, I hope that we can achieve some ecosystem alignment um, on what are the things that we need to discuss. And I think all the things we heard here today from the kind of fora we need, uh, who needs to be involved, questions on mindset shift, um, um, cultures of regulation that exist up until now, the learnings of that come from previous um, Web 1 um, 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 sort of um, innovations, um, things we have learned for how to deal with very disruptive technologies. All of this, we need a sort of alignment in the ecosystem and, and, and I'm, I'm personally carefully almost pessimistic, I, I, I believe that there's no perfect set of, of, of principles for how to address this. This is extremely complex and you ask 200 people and you get slightly different views, but the question then is if this is the ecosystem we live in, how do we optimize for this? And I think this is a question that we don't ask ourselves enough. We don't have this sort of meta discussion on, on how ethical principles actually work in practice. And we can learn from other Areas. Um, um, we are, and, and I want to finish on this because, with with a note of also kindness to to this ecosystem, um, if we look at health, bioethics, should you clone a human, yes or no, and and sort of the rapid reaction after um, the sheep Dolly was cloned, and everybody said, oh my God, this might have, you know, this is too much. Uh, let's let's not go there. In health, in medicine, we have millennia of people thinking about. What is life? Uh, what life should be saved? What is a good life and, and, and health and all of this? Technology is, is 30 years old, so I think we're still learning and it's part of, of, of where we are in the process, but it's very important that we focalize um, um, the entire energy in the ecosystem on those questions. So thank you for, for, for our amazing lead discussions on all the amazing work and important work that they are leading in the ecosystem. Uh, and thank you to all of you in the audience. I know we st we're standing between you and the German reception with German traditional beverages. So <laughs> thank you, thank you very much. Um, and um, if you want to get engaged in, 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 in the work um, of Project Liberties Institute, please reach out um, and um, enjoy the evening in Kyoto. Thank you. <laughs>